Good evening and welcome to this Wednesday webinar on the topic The Allied Forces in World War II, History, Consequences and the 21st Century World Order. My name is Nivedita Kapoor and I'm a junior fellow with the Strategic Studies program at the Observer Research Foundation. It is my pleasure to moderate today's discussion with a stellar panel of experts and I thank them for agreeing to be a part of this event which is being organized jointly by the ORF, the Russian Center for Science and Culture, Mumbai, and the Center for Central Eurasian Studies, University of Mumbai. I would like to extend my gratitude to our partners for this collaboration. A quick housekeeping announcement first. Sure. I request our audience, which is joining us live, to please send us your questions via the chat box below. We will keep a track of these questions and I'll post them to our panelists once the round of initial remarks is over. Now, as we are all aware, the disruption of the current world order, its evolution and the eventual shape that it will take has been a matter of much debate, especially in the last few years. The COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences have now led to concerns about a heightened US-China rivalry, fueling the question around the idea of a new world order. In this context, it becomes relevant to take a step back and investigate the history of the international system that we inhabit today. The impact of the Second World War in determining the trajectory of global events can hardly be denied. The war effort in itself followed by the establishment of the two blocs and the beginning of the Cold War determined much of the world's history after 1945 till the collapse of the Soviet Union. The, the disintegration of the Soviet Union gave rise to the unipolar moment in our history. And now the subsequent rise of China in the 21st century is leading to a more uncertain period. And so today our distinguished panel will look at both the past and the present in order to draw lessons for these uncertain times for the global system. So without further ado, I will now introduce our first speaker of the day, Dr. Sergei Fandi, who is the director of the Russian Center for Science and Culture in Mumbai. He is also the deputy to the head of the representation of the Russian government, Rastrudhi Chestova. Today, he will focus on the role of allied forces in World War II the consequences of the war and the lessons one can draw from it. Dr. Pandey, over to you. Namaste, dear friends and respected colleagues. First of all, I'd like to congratulate all of you the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, which had started, as you know, on the 1st September 1939 by Nazi Germans' invasion to Poland. You all well know this war was the bloodiest, more destructive, the worst war in the human history ever been. More than 60, more than 60 countries with 80% of the population of the globe were involved in this war and it lasted six long years. 75 years passed since the Japanese militarist government signed the Unconditional Surrender Pact on 2nd September 1945. 75 years ago. But till now, the World War II continues to attract more interest and to provoke more controversy than any other topic. That's why the topic of our conference, the Allied Forces in World War II, History and Consequences, 21st Century's World Order, is very interesting and must be discussed today. On my opinion, my dear friends, there are three big and main questions that we have to clarify today and find out the answers to them. First question, could the World War II have been prevented or avoided? Second question, what is the role of the Allied forces in the victory over Nazi Germany and military Japan? And third question, what are the lessons and consequences of Second World War? And what, what is 21st century's world order now? So before to answer to the first question, I'd like to remind you a very good and correct quotation that war is continuation of politics and politics always corresponds to the level of economic development of any country. 
It's not necessary maybe to tell you many theoretical things, but one of them is only well known German fascism to the end of 1939 as an extreme has managed to build very strong economy and very developed uh, military industry in infrastructure. And German fascism wanted to take revenge uh, to take revenge for its defeat in World War I and to revise the Versailles Treaty, which he was forced to sign in 1919. At those times, at those times, there was a strong international political organization that could stop or prevent the wars on the continent. Because the League of the Nations, you know, formed at the same time, was very weak and ceased to exist by 1939. If you will add the fascist racial policy of superiority of German nation over the other nations of the globe and expansionist, expansionist theories of Adolf Hitler that became very popular in German society at those times, we can affirmatively say the World War II couldn't be prevented and couldn't be avoided. Sooner or later, the fascist Germany could have started it. You know, the so-called Molotov-Ribbentrop non-attack pact signed in August 1939, as, as per Stalin, could have only pushed and moved further away the Russian boundaries from Kiev and Minsk to the West, and provided more time to USSR to prepare to inevitable war. Stalin blindly trusted Hitler and believed the latter start the war against the Great Britain first, and the Great Britain and the USA believed and were waiting Nazi Germans will start to wage war against their sworn enemies, Soviet communists, and connived Hitler to take over all of Europe. So, all historians agree that Second World War couldn't be prevented or avoided at those times. Answering to the second question, First of all, we will have to admit that the main role of USSR and Russian Soviet people in the great victory over the fascist Germany and its accomplices, Italy, Romania, and Japan, is undeniable fact. And the whole world admitted that the heroic feat of Russia and Russian people in the World War II is second to none. Of course, we cannot ignore the participation of the allied forces of the USA, the Great Britain, and the forces of resistance of France, Spain, Yugoslavia, and Greece in the victory in the Second World War. We cannot as well forget the struggle, the struggle of Chinese people against the military Japan. We all well know that the total losses made in World War II are about 80 million of people. 27 million of them are the Russians. More than 35 million Chinese, 6 million Jews, 6 million Polish people, more than 6 lakh French people, 4 lakh British people, 4 lakh Americans. And what was the contribution of the Allied forces in the great victory? What says the fact? What says the facts? Square and fair, I will tell you, the facts say that there was the French resistance movement which became active and significant only in 1943 after Stalingrad and Kursk battles won by USSR. And only in November 1943, after above mentioned battles, the leaders of the USA and the Great Britain agreed to meet with Stalin in Tehran conference, where they promised to open the second front in May of 1944. Really opened, you know, in July, in June uh, 1944. Of course, we cannot deny the USA land lease program that supplied 12% of all tanks, 20% of the all military aircrafts, 25% of food, and 70% of military vehicles and cars that were used in World War II by Russian and Allied military forces. But you know all well, but you all well know, my dear friend, that tanks, cars, and planes could be restored, repaired and even produced in you. But what about the people, which is the main resource of any country? And what about more of more than 20 millions of Russian men, soldiers, and officers who died and perished in this war? They had never come back to their home, to their mothers, their wives, their children, to their beloved ones. Many, very many Russian women remained widows after uh, World War II, and many children orphans. 
Many Russian men return mutilated, without legs and even hands. We cannot, of course, ignore the battles that the Allied forces waged in North Africa and Egypt, in Italy and Greece, and resistance movement fought in France, Spain, and Yugoslavia. We cannot forget the bloody fight in Burma and in the Pacific Ocean against the forces of the military Japan. But the casualties of the Allied forces were much more or less than Russians won. We firmly can tell that all progressive mankind all over the world stood up against the racial aggressive expansionist Nazi German in the West and the assertive militarist Japan in the east of the globe. So, notwithstanding the main battles against fascist German forces, which were led in the European part by the Red Army on the USSR, the many other smaller battles distracted German and Japanese military forces in many other places all over the world and united all progressive forces of the globe against the fascist plague. And now, my dear friends, I would like to tell you a little bit small few phrases about to answer to the third question, lessons of the history and consequences of World War II, and what is the 21st century's world order now? After the World War II, the whole world changed. The Great Britain has lost its role as world leader. The British Empire collapsed, and the new sovereign countries appeared in the, on the map of the globe, including India in 1947. The movement of African and Asian countries for their decolonization and independence started to raise incessantly and formed later the non-aligned movement. The USSR became a superpower as well as USA. The bipolar world was established for decades. Like you said, this is a Cold War. Began. Now, after the collapse of USSR in 1991, we can see the appearance of superpower, of new superpower, like China, for example. The threat of ultra-religious Muslim movement ICIC in Iraq and Syria. The exod of millions of poor Africans migrants to the Europe. The refugees camp in Syria. The belligerent statement of the ambitious religious state of Iran. And the rising Muslim movement in Turkey. The international terrorism and new military conflicts in the Middle East and Asia and new challenges that faces the developing democratic India and other countries in this region. All these facts are testifying us that a new world order is going to be formed and establishing all over the world now, with the new political and military alliances, new aspirations and new preferences. The new political and economic power centers and even superpower are arising. The new, even unexpected treaties and alliances are born. For example, recent Israel-United Arab Emirates peace treaty, China-Iran and China-Pakistan deals. The modern world is splitting on religious and cultural contentions, on different levels of economic development and different social political systems. The world is going to change once again, and mankind faces the new challenges. And now essential, and now it's very essential, more than ever, for all governments and nations to work together beyond borders in order to respond to all these changes. To all these challenges, sorry. And what about the lessons? The main lesson, I'm, uh, on my opinion, of this war for all countries and peoples all over the world is to place their political and economic might to maintain the peace on our globe, mutually beneficial trade and cooperation by any legal and possible means. Especially, this is very important nowadays, when there is a huge quantity of mass destructive nuclear weapons, because the consequences of nuclear war could be much worse than the World War II ones. We all have to fight in order to stop expansionism, religious contentions, and spreading ultranationalism. We have to extinguish and put out all kinds of conflicts and try to solve them peacefully. The world needs now the leaders who are uniting countries and nations and not splitting them. The whole world has now much more problems to be solved. International ultra-religious, as I said, terrorism and contentious, catastrophic changing of climate, 
uncontrolled pollution of ocean and atmosphere, starvation of population and fatal disease in Africa and in other places of the globe. And of course, the latest and unexpected global problem, pandemic of coronavirus COVID-19, which forced people of many countries and whole continents to be in home prison, to stop many activities, and which is not yet won, fought, and finished. What are the real tasks and challenges to be fought and solved by all of us, and not to dispute over the borders, national, political, economic, and religious supremacy, and other contentions and disagreements? The 21st century, I think, will be the Asian century. Even India and China's rivalry century in Asia, the 21st century will as well be the century of a big struggle for natural mineral resources and water. First, for improvement of the environment and of our planet and for winning the diseases and starvation. The 21st century will be the century of robotization and creation of artificial intelligence and of course a new sophisticated weapons. So the 21st century, first of all, must be century of peace of, on the globe. It is must. And we all have to call on all peoples all over the world, be united and strong, be decisive and active, be peaceful, responsible and cooperative in order to survive on this planet. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Shukriya, Danivat, Spasiba. Thank you, sir. That was indeed a very comprehensive account of the role of the Soviet Union in the Second World War, and you traced the development up to the present time. But what I wanted to ask you was if you could take your analysis just a little further, and in very short, uh, let us know about what you think the role of Russia will be in this new world order. Uh, sorry, sorry, repeat one more. Once more, what? Yes, sir. I wanted to ask you about the role that the present day Russia will play in the new world order. Uh, you know, Russia became uh, the great country uh, till now. Of course, USSR uh, was bigger than Russia one, but you know, Russia remains in a very, very big, a very powerful country. What is the role? You know, Russia is trying not to be involved in some conflicts, even with China, India, uh, India, Pakistan, and uh, in other uh, part of the world. But Russia is participating in Syria, you know, because, you know, now due to Russia, now there is peace. Not very good, not very long, not very strong peace, but there is peace. There is no ICIC um, uh, movement like uh, before, you know. Cutting head, cut, cutting head, cutting everything, you know. So uh, Russian's role is um, to equilibrate. To I think um, Russia is um, must to be to make equilibration between conflicts. Um, Russia doesn't want to in, um, meddle in some interferes uh, interfere in some in, in internal affairs of any country, you know. So uh, what uh, is the role of Russia? I think this is a stabi st stabilizing role, stabilizing role uh, in the world because you know, very huge country, very big territory, not not very big pop population, not very big. Only you know about 150 millions, 150 millions, 147 millions of population in Russia. Uh, this is a you know 10 times less than India, 10 times uh, and than China, for example, twice less than USA. So uh, Russia, uh, but Russia has um, very good intellectual potential, you know. Like uh, that's why I'm telling as always that Indian and Russians they are very very similar, you know. They are they have all, all the same soul, they have same mentality, not the same food, of course. Because chapati we don't eat, but in any case, you know, we like Indian food, <laughs> yes. But uh, we have, uh, if my friends who, who were um, studying in Moscow, they will, they can you prove my words. We are very similar, really. Not Chinese, Chinese and Russian, 
not Americans and Russia, not uh, German and Russia, not uh, this difference, mentality, different everything. But even I'm telling you, even we have some very good feast, uh, for example, in, in the um, beginning of uh, um, uh, spring, we are burning our muslins, you are burning your holika. Same, same custom, you know. Maybe 10,000 years ago, we were one nation, we were one people, I don't know. But many, many similar uh, customs, many, many similar mentality we have with, with you. And I'd like Russia and India relationship will be strong, will be, will, will be very, 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 very good. And uh, because this is a one uh, of uh, stability in Asia and South Asia if Russia and India will be together, you know. So uh, I think the uh, role of Russia very big now, huge, because uh, if country is small, if country is not powerful, its role, its role in the world is not very big. But Russia till now remains very big uh, country, has very good, uh, very big, strong um, weapons till now, uh, because, you know, um, uh, there is some saying, uh, very ancient saying, uh, Italian uh, Rome saying, if you want, uh, if you want, pet, if you want the peace, be please armed, be please well armed. Civis passam parabellum, civis passam parabellum. If you want to have peace, be armed, be strong. You know. So that's why um, I'd like to say you that Russia, Russia's role in the world now very big, very huge, and this is a not belligerent role. This is a role of pacific role, this <clears throat> role of uh, stabilizing situation uh, on our borders, on our borders in Asia, in the uh, Middle East, for example. So we, we are not threatened to anyone. We are not threatened to anyone. Like uh, Indian people, like uh, India, we never started war. Centuries, millions, you know, 2,000 years, 3,000 years, we didn't uh, start any war against somebody. India as well like this. Only defending. We were defending like Indian people as well. So we are not belligerent, but, but, but we are strong. If somebody comes to us, we can answer. We can tell them no need. So sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fandi. And your answer brings us right to the focus of the talk of our next speaker, who is Professor Ajay Patnayak, who teaches at the Center for Russian and Central Asian Studies, the School of International Studies at JNU. Professor Patnayak has also served as the Dean of the School of International Studies. And today he will reflect on the position of the present day Russian Federation in an evolving world order. Professor Patnayak, the floor is yours. Let me first start with saying, that Russia has never been accepted as an equal power by the West in entire history. If you, I'm mean, not going into 19th century, you know, the Crimea War, when you know, France, Britain, the Ottoman Empire ganged up and fought the Crimea War to defeat Russia. Then, you know, 1876, Russia's victory over Turkey. Everything was taken away in the Congress of Berlin in 1878. So I'm not going into that, but if you go to the Second World War, as a brief prelude to it, why it has not been accepted as an equal power, especially after coming to power of the communists in 1917, the West was even more hostile towards Russia. When Hitler came to power, the West always believed, I think, that Hitler will ultimately finish Russia and clear the way for the West to dominate the Eurasian space, which Mackinder talked about in 1904, the geopolitics. Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, and Mein Kampf wanted Lebensraum, that is living space for the Germans, and if wrote that the living space for Germans would be mostly Eastern Europe and Soviet Union. So that being his declared objective, the West did nothing to prevent Hitler from growing militarily, from snatching territories, Sudetenland, then Czechoslovakia, then Austria, gobbled up, you know, parts of Europe. And in the Spanish Civil War, we have seen this, they watched in silence 
and only the Soviet Union helped the Republicans there and managed to get Franco, another fascist, to power in Spain. So th the history is that the alliance was not out of love for Soviet Union or Russia or treating it as an equal partner, but a compulsion and necessity because Hitler not only went towards Poland, but it also attacked France. And, you know, uh, then the Italy also was moving into Abyssinia and other places. So this was a compulsion. The, the opportunity was in 1939, before the Nazi-Soviet pact of August, 23rd August 1939. The Soviet Union wanted desperately a pact, you know, something like that, mutual assistance treaty, among with Britain and other powers. You know, they sent low-level officials to negotiate with Soviet officials who did not have any power to sign an agreement, forcing Soviet Union to conclude that the West is not interested in containing Nazi Germany, whose declared goal is to move towards Soviet Union and capture it. That is why Stalin had to sign the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact in 1939. Before that, for a month and a half, he negotiated with the representatives. It didn't happen. Then the second front opening. Soviet people were dying like flies, seized, you know, seized, seizing the cities like Stalingrad, like Kursk, St. Petersburg, hundreds of days of seizure and continuous bombardment and the West never came and opened the Second Front. Imagine waiting till 1944 June when Soviet army had already started moving the Nazis from Soviet territory, ending the blockade and pushing ahead. And they came and opened the Second Front when they realized that the Soviet army is going towards Germany very fast, very fast. And the race for Germany started when Soviet army was moving into Poland and then forward into Germany. And it actually managed to hoist the red flag on the German parliament before the Allied could reach. There is a story also, why did they bomb Japan when Soviet troops had already cleared Manchuria and were pushing into Japan? To force them to surrender to the United States. So there are many nuanced stories within but the fact remains they never accepted Soviet Union or Russia as an equal post-Cold War, despite post dam despite Yalta, all these conferences in the United Nations. The West went into a Cold War mode with this containment strategy in 1948 or something, the containment strategy of Soviet Union. So, I mean, I can understand it was an ideological divide. The West had to do this. But what about post-war, post-Cold War order? When you had a friendly government in Russia under Mr. Yeltsin, who was trying to integrate Russia with Euro-Atlantic structures in the 1990s, the West found, you know, this is a convenient time to make NATO's eastward expansion. When NATO has become a relic of the, after the dismantling of the Warsaw Pact, NATO survived, not only survived, expanded eastward, including into former Soviet republics of Baltic states. And then, you know, it is NATO's expansion, and then came the theories like, again, reviving the Mackendarian geopolitics of pivotal states, Eurasia, heartland theories. And if you read Brzezinski's book on Grand Chessboard, he finds these pivotal states, the states which have some problem with Russia, states that have some problem, Georgia, Ukraine, Uzbekistan, these became for them the pivotal states which the West should focus on to try to limit Russian influence in the post-Soviet space. So again, the containment strategy begins, and it started with, you see, what happens in the post-Cold War scenario? before the containment strategy. It is the West which is trying to reshape a world order, which in place of the old bipolar world order will create a unipolar world order. 
dominated by the Western powers and its military organizations, the NATO. And they started this process through unilateral actions outside the sanctions of the United Nations. In Iraq, then the worst case scenario before Iraq was the bombing of Yugoslavia, where the Russian, you know, had such civilizational and historical cultural contact with the Serbs, bombing Yugoslavia to force into submission, and then Iraq. All the Russian allies, perceived allies, have been bombed unilaterally outside the sanction of the United Nations. So unilateral actions outside the sanctions, limiting the sovereignty of the states, independent countries, limited sovereignty, in the name of human rights, in the name of democracy, in the name of finding weapons of mass destruction, the West could invade any country, bomb any country, and destroy its sovereignty. So sovereignties of the countries were being bypassed in the name of democracy and human rights. From, out, from this, this context, when Russia is weak, Russia itself is looking for a you know, closer partnership with the West, you find the Western behavior is totally contrary to what Russia is expecting from the West. Russia's expectation is to have a good relationship with the West, to have good relationship with the Euro-Atlantic structures like EU and you know, other things. Whereas the West is trying to fill this vacuum left by Soviet Union by unilaterally attacking states perceived to be former Russian allies and then trying to build on the debris of this, you know, Soviet disintegration, a new world order, which people call it unipolar world order, where only the one side determines which country will get assistance, aid, economic help, because there is no Soviet alternative. So gradually we are seeing the rise of unipolarity, the rise of unilateralism, uh, until and unless Russia does something. Because in the 90s, China was not such a big power as today it appears to be. So it is the revival of Russia on which, you know, this stemming the tide of unilateralism depended so much. Because Russia had the military power, Russia has all the resources, it needed a determined leadership, which came in 2000 when Putin comes to power as Russia's president and makes multipolarity a strategic policy or strategic goal of Russia. Please remember, Putin makes this multipolarity a strategic goal objective of Russia. Though before him, one great Russian politician and diplomat, Evgeny Primakov, had talked about Russia-China-India triangle, strategic triangle. But he was speaking at a time when India, Russia, China, all three were closely moving towards the U.S. and its allies. So it was not possible at that point of time. But he was a visionary who saw that the rise of these three countries is, is going to happen, and this rise is being blocked by the West, will be blocked by the West. They have to come together. And Putin facilitated that process by making multipolarity a strategic objective towards which he started working. And in 2002, we had RIC, Russia, India, China Dialogue Forum of Foreign Ministers, which annually meets and which led, leads to BRICS in 2006 and the first summit in 2009 at Ekaterinburg where the, the leadership meets and annually they are meeting. So Russia's role was vital to push this process of multipolarity. Otherwise, the world would have been a unipolar world order long back. Thanks to Russia, I would say, that this system is halted. Russia had many compulsions. It did not really immediately uh, plan it. But the compulsions of you know, breaking this con new containment, new containment, encircling Russia with states which will be allied to the West. And how do you achieve that objective? By color revolutions 
in 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 states which are neighbors of Russia or you know in the neighborhood. So you see the color revolution in Georgia, Ukraine, and hoisting their leadership, which is pro-Western, which wants to join NATO, not just European Union, wants to become a NATO member. So being you know uh, wary of this kind of developments in its own neighborhood. And Russia, for having ignored the post-Soviet states in the 90s, decided to focus more on its near abroad, which it calls near abroad, the former Soviet Republic. So then we see a series of movements where Russia tries to break this containment and tries to pull back the Central Asian states and others to, to its own you know, uh, partnership be it Kyrgyzstan, which gave air bases to American forces, be it Uzbekistan, which gave bases to U.S. All of these things started rolling back by the time we come to 20, you know, 12, 13 or so. By 2014, Kyrgyz base is closed. 2005, the Uzbek base is closed. So at least from the eastern side, Russia feels a bit better and can focus more on partnership, stopping international terrorism, stopping, you know, drug and other non-traditional security threats, weapons, drugs from Afghanistan, all these things Russia can focus on by building structures like collective security treaty. Nivedita, some internet problem may be a Jaipat Naik has. So you can maybe, yeah, yeah. okay, you can maybe pass word to Suresh or something. Yeah, I think uh, there's some problem with uh, Professor Patnaik's internet. So if he comes back, we'll uh, carry forward the discussion with him. Uh, but in the meantime, um, given Pro Professor Patnaik was talking about the present role of Russia in the evolving world order, uh, and the next speaker, who is Professor Desh Pandey, he will talk about how the history has proceeded, which is essentially focusing on the world order immediately after, after the Second World War. So we'll get the perspective of both the past and the present uh, through Professor Desh Pandey's presentation. Uh, Professor Sanjay Desh Pandey is the director of the Center for Central Duration Studies at the University of Mumbai. His research focuses on international politics, social cultural studies, and he's also a prolific writer on issues of Indo-Russia relationship and India-Eurasia relationship as well. Uh, Professor Deshpande, uh, may I invite you to please make your presentation? Yes, uh, thank you, Nivedita. Uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you here in our meeting. I, uh, in this webinar on a very important topic. Uh, exactly 75 years back today, uh, the world has seen the end of uh, the bloodiest war in the history of human mankind, the Second World War. And uh, the war uh, which uh, began on 1st of September with the invention of Poland by the Nazi Germany and ended on 2nd September uh, 1945 with the defeat of Japan uh, in the East uh, uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, there are several issues uh, I would like to uh, address here, uh, and, but my topic uh, the, would be that how the new, how the world order uh, took place after the Second World War. Uh, during the war time, because, uh, before understanding this issue, we have to go into the little bit in the history during the war time. Uh, during the war time. Uh, during the war, the big three, England, France, uh, England, United States, and uh, this erstwhile Soviet Union met several times to decide the fate of Germany, Japan, and post-war uh, world order. Two 
uh, in this context, two prominent conferences were held uh, in Yalta and Pozdam. These big three uh, participated in these conferences. However, these, uh, uh, these countries failed to settle most of the important issues and thus help, uh, help set the stage for the Cold War. Soviet Union insisted that Germany be completely disarmed because the Germany has started two world wars. Uh, they have initiated that. So therefore, uh, the Soviet leadership was of the opinion that uh, Germany should be disarmed. But American President Truman had deep suspicious, uh, suspicions about the Soviet intentions in Europe. Uh, in the end, it was decided that Germany will be divided into three parts, uh, three zones of occupation and defer discussion of uh, German reunification until it uh, later date. And uh, three you know, parts uh, form the Federal Republic, uh, Republic of Germany, that what called the, the West Germany, and then Soviet occupation zone was called the German Democratic Republic. And these two countries were born uh, from this uh, discussion. The other notable issue uh, was discussed during these conferences uh, that was virtually unspoken. Truman informed everyone in the Potsdam conference that U.S. had successfully tested the first atomic bomb, and Americans were hope. Uh, Yes, Americans uh, and Americans were hoping to use this weapon as leverage with the Soviet Union in post-war uh, world order. Truman mentioned to Stalin, uh, casually mentioned even, that America is now in possession of a, a very powerful weapon. This is called atomic bomb. But he was disappointed when the Soviet leader merely responded that he hoped the United States would use it to bring the war with Japan to a speedy end and bring peace uh, everywhere in the world. After the war, Truman became more convinced that he had to adapt a very tough policy towards the Soviet Union. And Stalin, and Stalin strongly believed that both the United States and Great Britain were cons are making some conspiracy against the Soviet Union and the socialist system. Uh, as uh, everyone knows that many socialist governments uh, were formed in the East and Central Europe with the help of the uh, USSR. Uh, so the main course of the Cold War and the post-war world order was mainly distrust between the United States and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union wanted repercussions from Germany after the World War and a buffer, uh, buffer of friendly states to protect the USSR being invited again, mm -hmm. uh, uh, being invited, uh, invited, uh, invited again. The United States and Great Britain wanted to protect Western liberal democracy and help Germany to recover uh, because they were worried that large areas of East and Central Europe were falling under the Soviet control and influence. And Soviet Union's tensions toward the Allies started when the United States and Britain waited to open the second front in East Europe and, US, uh, and USSR against Germany. This caused Soviet Union to lose many million soldiers and uh, citizens. Americans also terminated their proposed aid to USSR before the war ended in Europe. So that was the mistrust between the two powers. Uh, hence, the distrust between the former allies in World War II led to uh, the Cold War and uh, subsequently to a world order. Uh, and uh, everyone knows and this has resulted into a Cold War which has started, uh, we can say after the immediately uh, after 1945 uh, between the United uh, between the United States, uh, States and the Soviet Union uh, and their respective allies. Uh, after the Second World War, the two great powers, Britain and France, lost their uh, status as superpower, and uh, United States and the Soviet Union became new new superpowers in this 
uh, world uh, new world or uh, in this world order and there was uh, and this uh, this war uh, this war was a war between the two superpowers namely united states and the soviet union the two systems uh, and two ideologies the capitalist and socialist ideology which continued for four and a half decades till fall of berlin war reunification of germany in 1989 disintegration of the soviet union in december 1991 and collapse of the world socialist system in europe in short allies in world war 2 became enemies and this has shaped the world order and set uh, and led the uh, led to the cold war and created a bi bi bipolar world uh, so uh after the disintegration of the soviet union uh, what uh, what was the scenario what was the uh, new world order i can say uh, in this context uh the post cold war world order was little bit different because uh, the bipolar system collapsed as uh, united states remained the sole superpower and uh, uh but after 1991 this and the disintegration of the soviet union gave a boost to the rising powers of the uh, powers of the united states and china this area has mostly been dominated by the rise of globalization enabled by the uh, commercialization the previous world order paved the way for nationalist movements and internationalism uh, following the nuclear crisis of the cold war Uh, many nations found it necessary to discuss a new form of international order and internationalism where countries cooperated with uh, one another instead of using nuclear scare uh, so the, this new system which uh, uh, took born that which, which was born after 1991 has seen the united states become the most powerful country in the world and rise of china from a developing socialist country to uh, into a uh, powerful potential superpower reacting on the rise of china the united states has strategically sought a rib rebalance the asia pacific region and the and at the turn of the century this uh, politics the global politics has shifted from uh, at, uh, from atlantic to asia pacific it has also seen the merger of most uh, of europe into one economy and the shift of power from g7 to g20 uh, accompanied uh, accompanied uh, accompanying to nato expansion uh, in eastern europe and at the western border of the russian federation ballistic missile defense system were installed in east europe uh, and moscow uh, this still feels that these actions are targeting russia uh, so uh, russia also uh, at the turn of the century russia also has shown a visible changes in its economy military so post cold war order uh, gave way to multipolarity uh, multipolarity and uh, russia also became a energy superpower energy superpower and but not a reliable superpower we can say and uh, and uh, because of this many uh, issues with many countries particularly uh, we can say they, they call gas war this first with ukraine so with some other countries took place and uh, uh, but still uh, we cannot deny that uh, professor patnaik has rightly said russia will remain the most important global player uh, in the uh, international politics uh, and russia is using its energy and natural resources as uh, a tool of its uh, uh, foreign and defense policies and there is no doubt that uh in this multipolar system russia will play a very dominant role in near future thank you thank you so much professor deshpande and i'm i'm glad to know that professor batnayak is also back with us so i want you to post 
pose one question to both Professor Patnaik and Professor Desh Pandey. Uh, because both of you have spoken about the important role that Russia continues to play in global affairs. Uh, but in the past few years, we have seen uh, Russia get closer to China, but at the same time, its relations with the West have deteriorated. So what are the challenges do you think that will face Russia if the U.S.-China rivalry continues to intensify in this current period? So, uh, would Professor Patai, would you like to go first? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You see, vis-a-vis with, with U.S.-China, Russia has no problem because Russia, has, Russia is already facing sanctions from the West after the Ukrainian issue. Russia has still gone ahead and signed energy deals with China. So, and they are, you know, neighbors. They will, they will, Russia will not be swayed by this problem. The problem will come vis-a-vis -vis India and China. That is where, because both are very close friends of uh, Russia today, very strategic friends. China is an economic power, Russia is under sanctions, and Russia's energy resources will flow to China, a lot of it flows to China. The dilemma will start there, because through BRICS, Russia has been trying to build an, you know, a kind of grouping in which India, China, Russia, or other emerging powers like South Africa, Brazil will play a role. BRICS will face roadblocks because of India-China problems. And fortunately, Russia is in this grouping because Russia is in the best position to become an honest mediator or a bridge. For example, we are soon going to meet, you know, in Russia for the SEO summit. So there are various forums available to both India and China to interact with Russia and through Russia try to minimize their problems. There are enough external issues or global commons on which India and China agree, like environment, for example, the climate change. So they, they all agree that the Paris Accord should be supported. They all support multipolarity. They all support alternative financial order and created the new development bank, you know, which will be helping the countries in the southern Paris, you know, hemisphere. So they have, uh, you know, coordinated in a lot of institutions, cooperated through a lot of institutions, but the border issue has not been solved and creating to tension. And Russia obviously has helped China, Russia is helping India. If you look at the Russian support to India, you'll be amazed. Most, most strategic areas Russia is helping. Atomic, space research, you know, these are the areas, you know, very latest missile technology. These are areas which will make India a very strong power. So Russia has probably taken a strategic decision without declaring that it wants to become a very strong player in Asian region very strong power. So multipolarity, not at the global level, but in Asian level also, where India should not become a weaker power. The kind of support we get from Russia in critical areas, where we will not get uh, so much of support, uh, Russia is giving to probably make India a very strong power in this region also. And Russia is in the position, as I has told you, to be a bridge between China and India, when differences rise, they both can really utilize Moscow to overcome their differences or at least meet and discuss because they are not bilaterally in a position to discuss in a forum like BRICS or SEO, you know, they can meet and at least, you know, discuss a few things. Meetings can take place. Thank you. I'll take your leave, Nivedita. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for joining joining us. We know that you have uh, you, you have some work and you need to take care of it. So thank you so much for so joining I, us. See, my, my daughter is going to Rome late evening. So we have to drop her in the airport. And her packing okay. and few things we have to purchase. So okay. that's why from morning, morning I've been under some pressure to, you know, see that because when she will come back under the pandemic yeah. or we can go to Rome. 
I'm not sure. So there is certain bit of uh, anxiety in the house. Family. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and all the best to uh, to your daughter for her right. studies abroad. Thank you, uh, Professor Desh Pandey. Would you like to come in on the question now? Nimitita. Yes, sir. She is not going to study. She is becoming an astronaut. Oh, that's that. <laughs> she is already a PhD from Stanford. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, India, Russia, China uh, working on many platforms together. First, BRICS, SEO, and RIC also. RIC was mooted by uh, Evgeny Primakov, the former prime minister. When he was foreign minister of Russia, uh, he mooted this idea. And uh, he uh, thought that uh, these three countries should work uh, uh, tandemly together uh, and counter the dominance of the United States in the uh, inter uh, world politics. Uh, but after uh, 2001, uh, the situation had changed uh, drastically. Uh, when uh, Al-Qaeda has uh, attacked the uh, United States uh, and, uh, and in uh, past several months we see the tension between China and India on the border, uh, Sino-Indian border. So in this context I can say that yes, we should, uh, India should not uh, uh, or both the countries should not fight with each other. And, uh, in the it, uh, and they should work together and russia will play a major role in solving sino-indian uh, dispute because uh, uh, because russia uh, doesn't want to lose china uh, either china or india and china uh, has hugely invested in india nearly more than 90 billion dollars business we do with china but uh, uh, though our political relations are uh, have worsened in last several months, but one thing is that these uh, uh, I can say the trade and economic relations will play a uh, major role in any country's uh, bilateral relations. Uh, as far as Russia is concerned, we have 13 to 15 dollars, uh, 15, 13 to 15 billion dollars. Uh, business though we enjoy very good diplomatic and political relations we do have very uh, uh, historical cultural linkages with russia uh, we see from last four, four, 550 years when afan asini kitin uh, visited india in 1469 uh, to 1472 and uh, so that's why i can say that uh, this is a temporary Surely, India and Russia uh, and China will work together, and uh, there will be no. Uh, and what I feel as a student of international relations, there will be no superpower in future. Many uh, centers of powers uh, are emerging, and they will play. Everyone will play their own white, uh, own role in global politics. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. And now when we are talking about Indo-Russia relations, we can hardly discount the importance of Central Asia. Uh, so to talk on this topic, I am glad to welcome Ambassador T. Suresh Babu, who is the former ambassador of India to Armenia, Georgia, and Mongolia. A fluent Russian speaker, he has a rich experience when it comes to policies in CIS countries and Eastern Europe, and which also makes him the perfect choice to look at the post-Cold War events after the disintegration of the Soviet Union with a particular focus on current developments in Central Asia. Ambassador, over to you. Uh, by uh, the previous uh, speakers, um, of course, we are moving uh, uh, we are. Uh, I think we, we have almost moved from 
uh, uh, Europe to Asia. Uh, as we see uh, uh, with the disintegration of uh, USSR, or we call it uh, the, the end of Cold War, in which the Soviet Union, the socialist system, has been uh, has conceded to uh, its uh, well. We call it uh, uh, defeat, um, you know, uh, to the, uh, the to the Western domination. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the entire uh, the global focus, uh, the focus are the entire global discussion on the the new emerging international order has moved to the Asian continent. Uh, uh, despite the fact that Asia was always, uh, I mean, Asian powers uh, always played a, a very decisive role, uh, uh, even pre-Cold uh, uh, War, I mean, even during the Cold War also. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, now it's becoming more and more evident that uh, uh, the world order, the new world order, what we call it, are the uh, the new international system uh, now cannot uh, progress further, cannot advance further without the participation of Asia. Uh, we have we have Russia, we have China, we have Japan, we have Korea. Uh, uh, not to talk about other uh, other countries in the South Asia. Um, um, we'll we'll talk a little later on that. But uh, since you have mentioned about Central Asia. Uh, I must uh, uh, confine to the subject that you asked me to say. Um, as uh, uh, Professor Deshpande and also Professor Patnaik, both of them have uh, more or less uh, on the same page when it comes to uh, Russia's uh, uh, crucial uh, role uh, in its so-called backyard uh, or its uh, zone of influence, what we call it. So, nevertheless, uh, in the central Asian, the five stands that we are talking about, uh, they fell uh, casualties of the end of the Cold War, end of the, uh, I mean, the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Uh, these, uh, this central Asian region, uh, per se, uh, well, uh, historically, it was uh, always uh, dominated by the Russian Empire and uh, followed by the USSR. Uh, uh, so therefore, uh, almost for two centuries, I think Central Asia was uh, dominated by Russia, uh, and uh, the later part of the modern history, of course, the China uh, of late China in the last 20, uh, last 30 years. Uh, so um, unfortunately, these uh, five uh, uh, the Central Asian republics um, um, uh, um, have become actually have become uh, uh, vulnerable to uh, uh, to, uh, to to their growth um, uh, and uh, uh, the Central Asian republics. Uh, uh, I must say that uh, uh, you know all these uh, five republics. They uh, 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 they were in a kind of a situation of distress because they were completely lost after the shock, um, after taking the shock of the uh, disintegration of USSR. Uh, because uh, all five republics, they, uh, their economies, their industries, their agriculture, their uh, the all sectors of their uh, societies were uh, shattered, uh, uh, and uh, definitely they uh, needed uh, uh, they needed uh, uh, a disparate help. From outside the region, uh, of course, the Russia came to rescue them in initially, uh, but at the same time, given the uh, energy potential of this entire region, uh, namely Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, and other uh, uh, one or two republics, I mean Uzbekistan, not to talk about other uh, republics, uh, Turkmenistan, of course. Uh, these uh, uh, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan being the uh, uh, being the um, the largest energy uh, hubs of, I mean, the centers of largest uh, energy resources. Uh, the Western, the Americans, the uh, the Euro Europeans, uh, uh, Americans uh, precisely, of course, they looked at this region as another stepping stone uh, to control the entire the region. 
so they came they invested initially they came with huge investments uh, to tap this uh, untapped potential of these uh, republics um, you know the chevron and uh, british petroleum and all these big uh, multinationals uh, invested hugely in this kazakhstan and uh, uh, in, uh, and other, uh, and turkmenistan uh, because they looked at uh, energy, uh, they wanted to play energy politics, they wanted to play energy uh, game, uh, game as we say uh, in this region. Uh, then happened uh, the initial stage 90s of course uh, these uh, uh, Central Asian countries um, uh, 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 they, uh, as I said they, they were disparate in uh, reviving their uh, uh, societies, they are reviving their socio-economic uh, conditions. Uh, because the previous the Soviet so-called welfare systems have collapsed and they, didn't, they couldn't create a new uh, systems to protect their uh, societies, uh, to raise the uh, uh, living standards. So therefore, uh, they, uh, 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 they desperately needed investments. Um, but having uh, 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 invited these uh, US and other uh, uh, major investors like Turkey, and then Japan. Uh, of course, they looked at uh, uh, for, resource, uh, for financial uh, uh, help, but at the same time, uh, it was Russia which realized the hidden, uh, the hidden uh, intentions of uh, uh, these foreign investors, the overseas investors, uh, because uh, 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 as I said, Central Asia uh, always, uh, you know, remained as Russia's. You know, we call it backyard. Uh, uh, with, with you know, there are a lot of factors that unite uh, Central Asia with Russians uh, because the language is there, the culture is there, and uh, so therefore, uh, and then happened uh, as we see uh, the 2000, uh, uh, what they call it, 9/11. Uh, the World Towers, uh, the World Trade Tower was attacked by the uh, Al Qaeda's, um, and suddenly the terrorism. You know, the Afghanistan became the flashpoint uh, for terrorism, and uh, of course, the Americans they wanted to use the Central Asian territory for uh, uh, for deploying their forces, uh, deploying their military bases, and uh, and from there to control. Uh, of course, the idea was to fight the uh, Al Qaeda, uh, to fight the terrorism in in Afghanistan. But uh, uh, you know, Russia realized uh, uh, American intentions of setting up these military bases uh, in in, uh, in in return to few hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, grants or you know developmental uh, uh, schemes and etc. Uh, you know to uh, uh, to control these uh, small uh, Central Asian uh, republics. Um, of course, uh, Russia intensified. Uh, uh, Russia continued to uh, assure and reassure uh, its uh, support to the Central Asian countries uh, by also giving a lot of uh, uh, assistance, financial assistance, uh, and also Russia is also giving uh, uh, what they call shelter to uh, millions of Central Asian migrants to, in Russia, uh, which eventually became, uh, which subsequently uh, became the source of foreign exchanges. Uh, foreign exchange, uh, uh, you know, contributors to their economies, uh, because you know, the, uh, as I said, except Kazakhstan, uh, which has a very high uh, per capita income of ten to twelve thousand um, uh, dollars, you know, given its uh, uh, successful implementation of successful, you know, Nazarbayev's model, what they call it today, uh, the man, uh, the man with the vision who virtually converted Kazakhstan into one of the richest, uh, among the richest, uh, you know, Central Asian countries, uh, you know, with his own vision of, uh, uh, of you know, economy first and the politics later. Uh, so therefore, with that motive, I believe, uh, actually, you know, uh, 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 in fact, he who said that uh, in 1991, after the breakup of USSR, he said the Central Asian countries were almost at the very edge of the abyss. 
this is what he characterized and he said that this is that's why he realized that the, the economy is the first and then politics uh, so except Kazakhstan the other uh, four countries of course Kazakhstan now emerged as a leader in the Central Asian countries um, you know uh, Kazakhstan Nazarbayev in fact put Kazakhstan into the international map uh, in fact, it, he represented what should he emerge as a de facto representative of the Central Asian, all Central Asian countries, uh, with his vision uh, uh, of uh, maintaining a balancing, uh, you know, uh, playing a balancing act between the East and West, and also with Russia, uh, and also with uh, South uh, Asia, South Asian powers. Uh, so uh, thereafter, what happened? What we see uh, post 2000. Uh, um, well, you know, as uh, Professor Patnaik uh, uh, recollected that, uh, um, you know, Russia, uh, Russia has always been, uh, we call it as a provider of uh, uh, security uh, to this uh, uh, Central Asian region, uh, historically, I mean, during Soviet times, and Russia continued to provide uh, security cover, security assurances to Central Asian countries, because we have uh, actually the post-2000 uh, uh, the last, you know, ten, uh, the last 15 years, last 20 years, in fact, uh, you see, uh, we see uh, extreme uh, uh, trends of, uh, you know, terrorism and extremism uh, based on nationalism, na ethnic nationalism. In fact, uh, the creeping into the Central Asian countries. Uh, uh, so, uh, in fact, Russia, Russia offered its uh, uh, guarantees. Russia, want, Russia, Russia is the guarantor of uh, security and stability in this region so that Central Asia is stable, the Russia is stable. Uh, if the Central Asia is protected, Russia is protected. So therefore, uh, uh, with that uh, vision, of course, uh, in fact, President Putin, in fact, who uh, after uh, coming to power, it was Mr. Putin uh, who uh, consolidated uh, Russia's uh, presence in the Central Asia. And provided, uh, and, and has been uh, uh, playing a very, very crucial role. Uh, on one, on one hand, preventing the uh, Western dominance or the American dominance. On the other side, also balancing the Chinese influence in the uh, uh, in the in the region. Um, as uh, so, therefore, uh, and thereafter, what we see, uh, it was. Shanghai, Cooper, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO, uh, or CSTO, uh, and other uh, political and security structures which uh, uh, pressurized uh, the uh, Uzbekistan and uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, uh, to show the doors to the Americans uh, in terms of leaving their military bases. So Americans had to leave, uh, but at the same time, when Americans uh, they left, but even Americans even now also looking at Central Asia as uh, uh, as a uh, uh, as a as a zone of well their interest, but at the same time they do not want to cross swords with Russia. Uh, they want to maintain uh, some kind of presence uh, in the region. Uh, of course, conceding uh, uh, now uh, to Russia and uh, to China, of course. Uh, so this is what uh, now what we uh, see in this uh, region. Uh, what I said is that uh, coming back to the Central Asian republics as such, five republics as we see, we see a, we see a very, uh, a very powerful or very, uh, uh, very tough authoritarian, uh, you know, regimes uh, uh, in, in this region, um, and also we see uh, uh, um, these five, these four, five Central Asian uh, republics. Um, uh, you know, uh, 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 this. Uh, sorry, I <laughs> just say. Uh, anyway, coming back to the uh, the uh, the. Uh, there are well, maybe I'll answer on the. Or uh, should I go ahead with the uh, Russia, uh, China, or I mean, or I continue in the flow. Uh, uh, the Afghanistan I, thing. Uh, if I may bring in Dr. Pathak and then for the question answers, I'll again come back right, and we can answer the audience. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah, we'll, we, uh, maybe we'll break at that point and then we'll uh, yeah. maybe it'll be a Q&A. You know, China, uh, uh, China, Russia and also uh, extreme, uh, you know, the terrorism part also we'll discuss. Yeah, 
Yes, because a lot of audience questions are also coming in. So we'll take them uh, after Dr. Yeah. Pachak has thank made you. her remark. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Sorry, uh, before I close, I just wanted to congratulate uh, Dr. Fadeh, uh, uh, you know, our Russian colleague, uh, uh, with the 75th, 75th anniversary of the uh, uh, of the victory in the uh, Second World War. Uh, uh, at the same time, I would like to remind him and also uh, 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 congratulate myself also because uh, uh, Indians also participated in the Second World War in their own way. Uh, that is what we must appreciate. Uh, it is not only uh, Russia which won the war, but India also, as a you know, uh, Indian soldiers also fought in the British Army uh, as one of the Allied uh, forces. So uh, that's what I said. I just, it's a small note. I just wanted to congratulate myself also and all of us. <laughs> in Burma, in Burma battles, in Burma, Burma, da, Birmia. Yeah, 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 exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And now from Central Asia, uh, we will move on to a topic that has probably been the foremost on our minds in the past few months, that of China. Our next speaker, Dr. Sriparna Pathak, is an assistant professor and assistant academic dean at the Jindal School of International Affairs at the OP Jindal Global University, Haryana. With a combined extensive experience in academia, think tanks, and the press, Dr. Patak specializes in the Chinese foreign policy as well as its domestic economy. And today she will focus on tracing the arc of China's development from its involvement in the Second World War up to the present time, analyzing the impact of this history on current Chinese policy. Dr. Patak, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nivedita, and uh, thank you once again to the organizers for having me on board. Um, this is a very timely and pertinent discussion, not just because, you know, it's the 25th, 25th year anniversary, but because in this COVID-19 world order, there are constant references which are being made to the Cold War or to, you know, the sort of an emergence of um, some sort of a world war. You know, there are predictions that there might be a World War III. Um, you know, some people are predicting and drawing comparisons with uh, the international order which existed before the Cold War. So um, it becomes very important to have this discussion on the Allied forces during um, the World War and how events unfolded. And you know, we've had a lot of discussion um, from, uh, we've had a lot of uh, inputs from the different speakers on different aspects or different regions of international politics. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to talk on China during World War II and uh, just after, so that we can understand how certain Chinese foreign policies today they can be traced back to World War II. Um, you know, as compared to the world order that we are living in today, China and the US were actually allies during the World War, uh, during the Second World War. More than 250,000 Americans actually served in what was known as the China Burma India Theater. And China was actually the first country to enter what would become the Second World War. And it was an ally of the US and the British Empire from just after Pearl Harbor in 1941 to the Japanese surrender in 1945. China fought Japan with aid from the Soviet Union as well as the United States. So China was a significant player in the eventual Allied victory. And some scholars, they even consider the start of the full scale Second Sino-Japanese War in 1937 to have been the beginning of the Second World War. So China was definitely a very important player in Second World War. Um, just to go back to 1937, what was the Second, uh, what was the Second Sino-Japanese War? You know, the war was a result of a decades-long Japanese imperialist policy to expand its influence uh, politically and militarily in order to secure access to raw materials, food, and labor. In 1931, there was a certain incident, which was known as the Mukden Incident, which helped spark the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. What was this Mukden incident? On 18 September 1931, Lieutenant Suomori Kawamoto, he detonated a small quantity of dynamite close to a railway line, which was owned by Japan's South Manchuria Rail um, near uh, what was called Mukden now, which is now Shanyang in China. The explosion was very weak. In fact, it was so weak that it failed to destroy the track and a train passed over this track minutes later. The Imperial Japanese Army, it accused Chinese dissidents of the act and responded with a full invasion, which led to the occupation of Manchuria. 
Chinese were defeated and Japan created a new puppet state called Manchukuo. Um, in fact, many historians have actually cited 1931 as the beginning of the Second World. This view has been adopted by the People's Republic of China government. It exists till date and it becomes very integral in China's demands for reparations from Japan. These demands exist till date. So, you know, this goes back to Second World War. Going back to the 1930s again, in, on, on July 7th, 1937, there was a clash between the Chinese and Japanese troops at the Marco Polo Bridge, just outside Beijing. And this led to all-out war. A year later, in 1938, the Chinese military situation was very desperate. Most of eastern China lay in Japanese hands. Um, this included Shanghai, Nanjing, uh, Wuhan. And uh, several observers, several analysts at that time, they believed that China would not hold out. And the most likely scenario would be that there would be a Japanese victory over China. Nonetheless, China's leader, the nationalist Chiang Kai-shek, along with his unlikely allies, the communists, refused to surrender. And they retreated inland and they carried on resistance. This decision changed the fate of Asia. If China had surrendered in 1938, Japan would have controlled China for a generation or more to come. Japan's forces might have turned towards USSR, Southeast Asia, or even towards British India. The European and Asian wars might have never come together the way they did after Pearl Harbor in 1941. The Chinese hung on, and after Pearl Harbor, the war became genuinely global. The Western allies and China were now united in their war against Japan. China could not have won the war on its own. The defeat of Japan was dependent on Western and, in particular, American finance, military support and supplies. But stating this or acknowledging this does not mean or does not go on to deny the fact that China's contributions were very important to the war effort. China held down huge numbers of Japanese troops on its territory. It acted as an example to other non-Western countries, showing that it, is, it was possible to fight with the West and, you know, uh, still strongly oppose imperialism. Now, much of what happened during World War II was forgotten in the West as well as in China during the Cold War. Few wish to remember the regime of Chiang Kai-shek, which had been driven onto Taiwan by Mao Zedong's uh, Communist Party of China, Mao Zedong's Communists. In Mao's China, the Communist Party had little interest in providing any space for any positive reflections on the wartime contributions of their nationalist enemies, right? So basically, there was a civil war which um, you know continued even um, after after Pearl Harbor uh, between the communists and the nationalists. And uh, after the communists won, after the after you know the People's Liberation People's Republic of China was um, created um, on October first, nineteen forty nine, there was no there was no impetus per se, to remember any sort of good things which had been done by the nationalists, by Chiang Kai-shek, and they had relocated, and they had basically fled to the Republic of China or Taiwan. Now, before we go to Taiwan, um, just going back to what was happening during the Cold War, in Mao China, the Communist Party did not want to provide a space for wartime contributions of their nationalist enemies. And only from the 1980s onwards, when the Cultural Revolution had been discredited in the People's Republic of China and a new source of nationalism was needed, Chinese authorities started allowing a more broad-based reassessment of the Second World War, tried to rehabilitate the contributions of the nationalist government and the troops who had fought for it. Today, China has explicitly embraced huge swaths of war history, which remained taboo during much of the Cold War, um, what does this mean for the current, um, you know, uh, current international order? What it means, China embracing large parts of its um, World War II history and, you know, actively talking about it, actively having conversations about it. It also is a signal that the memory of the war will be used to make a case for changing geopolitics in the region. China is increasingly resentful of the U.S.'s role in Asia, and it argues that if American contributions to the defeat of Japan and in 1945 entitle us to have a continuing presence in asia then china's own sacrifices also grant it a role now this sort of an attitude is reflected in chinese stances against the installation of the terminal high altitude area defense the third for example in addition to this china's taiwan problem also goes back to world war ii after japan's unconditional surrender in 1945 
the allied forces took a decision on taiwan um based on uh, you know these uh, based on the outcomes of the cairo conference which took place in 1943 the cairo conference basically outlined the allied position against japan during world war 2 and they made decisions about post war asia in the context of japan's occupied territories including taiwan it was decided that japan will be stripped of all the islands in the pacific which it had seized or occupied since the beginning of the first world war in 1914 so all the territories which japan had stolen from the chinese including manchuria formosa or taiwan and the pescadores had to be returned to the republic of china now the republic of china moved its central government to taiwan in december 1949 following the victory of the communist party of china in the civil war which basically was from 1927 to 1949 now under pressure from the us japan signed a separate peace treaty with the republic of china to bring the war between the two states to a formal end with a victory for the roc after the war japanese prime minister shigeru yoshida he intended to approach the newly established people's republic of china economically and diplomatically However the US rectified this initiative and threatened to boycott the this uh, 1951 treaty of San Francisco which it had uh, with Japan if Japan did not engage with the KMT led nationalist China which is now Taiwan so the US required Japan to accept diplomatic relations um, with the KMT led nationalist China otherwise basically it would mean that uh, you know the war with the us would keep going on for japan and basically us or sorry japan would be kept under us military occupation with the eruption of the korean war and us and un intervention into the war diplomatic relations between the governments of japan and kmt led nationalist china were established following the termination of us occupation of japan in 1952 japan led logistics and artillery production or manufacturing to support the us in the korean war which acted as a major stimulus for the revival of its economy especially in um, heavy and light industry which became very evident in japan's post uh, war economic miracle now what was china doing at this time china was leaning to one side or to the side of communism during the cold war the prc under mao zedong had hoped to receive long term economic and military assistance from the soviet union but in the 1960s uh, the soviet union had withdrawn its soviet experts from the prc uh, which resulted in a sort of economic dilemma for the prc this was happening because china started aspiring for leadership in the communist bloc and disagreements between um, the ussr and china started increasing eventually in 1972 there was even a point where china saw the ussr as a bigger threat than the us and decided to establish ties with the us Chinese foreign policy has learned a lot of lessons from history. To begin with, as exhibited by the alliance between China and the US, there are no permanent friends or foes in international relations. Ideology can never be a basis for alliance between China and any country, as China has learned from its experience of leaning to one side during the Cold War. The post 1978 China also understands how being an economic heavyweight is extremely important for a country's comprehensive national power in the international system the chinese have long witnessed how the meiji restoration in japan brought a formidable japan at the global stage um you know the second world war or china's experiences since 1931 with japan also exhibited to it that um, you know china couldn't have won the war against the japanese on its own without american finance military support and supplies so all of this become very important calculations for the china which emerged in the latter years um china stands relations with japan go to the go back to the second world war and even before that and that is more or less a permanent feature of chinese foreign policy what china has also learned over these years is to utilize democratic institutions of um, western countries to further its own interests for example um, while Ch- china keeps seeking apologies and wartime compensation from japan time and again it stands on reparations when countries in the current covid-19 world order uh, seek an independent uh, investigation into the covid-19 or reparations their stance becomes very different you know um china uses its experience with history and colonialism to voice its stance against imperialism in fact its stance against imperialism did win it a lot of friends from developing countries aiming to free themselves from the shackles of imperialism back in the 1950s China's stature 
as the Middle Kingdom was disrupted by the experiences it had with Western and Japanese imperialism, followed by this bloody civil war, years of bad economic decisions, exemplified by the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution. However, as compared to that, as, as compared to that epoch of history, Xi Jinping's China has clearly arrived on the world stage owing to its political and economic clout. And it is now deemed apt that there is a revival and China gains its lost glory as the Middle Kingdom, which is seen in Xi Jinping's China dream. The attempt to regain that glory is visible in the form of increasingly aggressive foreign and economic policies to tackle poverty, unemployment, corruption, um, aggression uh, beyond the borders. And this was visible even in Xi Jinping's speech at the 19th Party Congress in 2017. Xi Jinping unprecedentedly espoused China's development path as a model for the world, especially for that, uh, especially for the developing countries. His re-emergence as a leader in the way that China was the Middle Kingdom before, uh, you know, before all this catastrophe was brought to it by, by, by the experiences of imperialism is a very important tenet of the Chinese dream. It exists till date and it can certainly be traced back to history. So, which is why, um, you know, this, uh, this, this uh, this particular webinar becomes very important and it becomes um, you know a very important discussion point so with that i come to the end of uh, my little um, speech thank you for your um, attention thank you for your patience thank you thank you ma'am and it's really interesting to see how chinese history is even today informed this foreign policy decisions we can trace this out of history and quite Surprisingly, the questions from the audience is also regarding the current position of China in the world order. And uh, uh, so Venkat Krishna wants to know how, what kind of position will China occupy in a new world order? And do you think that balancing coalitions are going to form to counter this rise? Uh, Dr. Patek, what would be your view on this? Um, you know, see, China has, as I, as I just said, China is a very important player in international relations. And, um, you know, I think um, the last few speakers have also talked about how is the Asian century. Um, you know, China's rise cannot be ignored. It is an economic and military heavyweight. Um, the world has to coexist with China. The world has to accept China's, um, China's ascendance. Uh, that being said, the fact also remains that China does have a lot of problems uh, with a lot of countries, not just one or two. And the aggression is just increasing in this COVID-19 world order, wherein countries are already, a lot of countries are already, um, you know, very distraught by the onset of the COVID-19. You know, um, public health systems have crashed, economics, economies have crashed. So um, there is already a lot of doubt and a lot of, um, you know, a lot, a lot of cynicism with respect to China. In addition to that is China's increasing hostility as seen in the South China Sea, with countries ranging from Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, well, India, um, its aggressive stances against the US, um, Taiwan. So it's the, the next few years, while it's very difficult to make a prediction if, if, the U, if China will replace the US as the uh, reigning hegemon of the system, what definitely can be said is that it will occupy a much more, uh, a much bigger space in international relations than it has in the past. Talking about balancing, um, you know, a lot of um, a lot of these tactics tactics have been taking place, and uh, you know, since we are sitting in, um, most of us are sitting in India, uh, you know, and we already know about the clashes which are uh, unfolding at the borders with India. Some of the things which India has also done is you know, trying to strengthen the quad or trying to reach out to other countries, trying to have some sort of bonhomie or military drills, etc. So the possibility of greater such, of, of, of more such tactics, which would try to balance China, it's going to um, increase in the near future. That being said, economic interdependence is one such thing, which is, it, which is very different in this current world order, which did not exist that much you know, in during the Second World War or the time periods, time frames uh, preceding that. So, um, because of globalization, because of technology, because of um, economics or economic interdependence, the fact is that the world will still remain enmeshed. We will still have some sort of dependence, but the fact will also remain is that 
through these dependencies, countries will try to reap maximum benefits for their own selfish narrow interests. So there's a possibility that the world might become more inward looking, more uh, neorealist in nature, uh, while not completely moving away, away from um, you know, these cooperative uh, engagements. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, another question. Uh, I think Ambassador T. Suresh Babu, if he takes that, this would be great. This question is from Dr. Gulwais Sheikh, who is asking as to how Russia is, is dealing with the intersecting interests of, uh, of, Ch of uh, China and Russia when it comes to SCO, especially in Central Asian space. Unmute, unmute, please. Sorry, so Babu, we can't unmute. hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. You know, uh, in fact, Shanghai Cooperation Organization is uh, uh, a, a very, very important uh, regional, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, grouping, uh, uh, you know, comprising of uh, four uh, uh, Central Asian countries as well as Russia and uh, China. Uh, I'm... Well, you know, in fact, it, it's been there uh, uh, almost 20 years now. Um, as we see, uh, as I see the question on the screen that, you know, uh, any intersecting interest of Chinese-led SUO against CSTO. Well, you know, uh, I, uh, well, I don't see any uh, major concern, uh, uh, you know, that might arise uh, in Central Asian region, uh, concern in the sense, uh, any, any 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 clash or any uh, of interest, uh, you know, between China and Russia in terms of SCO and CSTO, because CSTO is a very old organization. It was which was formed, uh, you know, early 90s, soon after the breakup of USSR, whereas SCO is uh, uh, SCO was formed much later. Uh, and SCO is uh, basically uh, it is uh, uh, as we see uh, uh, its prime objective is to uh, to encourage economic engagement, economic collaboration and uh, cooperation within the uh, space of the SCO. Uh, uh, whereas CSTO is primarily a security related organization. Uh, well, we call it, well, you know, some observers uh, uh, bring parallel to the NATO kind of a thing that Russia was trying to uh, pose a, a project CSTO as an answer to NATO. Uh, uh, but so, therefore, uh, they are two different. The nature of these two organizations is entirely different. So, say, we have one is the security, otherwise, uh, on the other side is the economic uh, uh, cooperation. So, therefore, I don't see any major concern, uh, any fear, you know, of the China might uh, get, you know, uh, disturbed with the CSTO. Okay, I can see that our audience uh, are sending in several questions. And they're really interesting ones as well, but I'm afraid that we're completely out of time. We have, in fact, exceeded our time limit. Uh, but before we go, I would like to thank our absolutely wonderful audience who joined us today, uh, and also heartfelt gratitude to our partners in this webinar, the Russian Center for Science and Culture, Mumbai, and the Center for Central Eurasian Studies, University of Mumbai. And last but not the least, a huge thank you to all the panelists who agreed to join us and gave us such detailed, wonderful insights. So thank you all once again, and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nivijita. Thank you to all. Thank you, Sriparna Patnak. Very nice speech. Thank you very much to all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so thank much. You, you know, I would like to say maybe a few words um, about uh, multipolar new world order in 21st century. I think, you know, uh, there, are, uh, there will be three center power, three center. First, this is the USA, Great Britain, this is Israel, and Japan. Another one is China, Iran, Pakistan, and uh, countries under in China's influence. And third power center, it must be, must be, it's my opinion, personal my opinion. This is a Russia, CIS country, and India. We would like to be together because, you know, uh, we will be inter, three, inter two, um, um, between, between two big centers, we will be like a uh, dancer, you know, 
every time. Like um, providing the security, like the story Babu told us, Professor Babu told us, this, Russia always provide, is providing security in the Asia region, South Asia region, in uh, all over the world. That's why I think it will be three uh, power centers. Even I don't understand where EU, uh, European, uh, United uh, Europe, United Europe, where it will be. She, uh, it is now not with USA, you know, some contradiction. Macron tells some contradiction with the USA. And maybe it will be with Russia and India and CIS because it is very interested in our gas, uh, petrol, our energy um, supplies, you know. That's why I don't know, but I think it will be multipolar, not bi bi uh, bipolar, not only China, USA. No, it will be three. And uh, it will be three power center, I think, in, in the future. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. And with that food for thought, we will end our broadcast now. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.